You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome back to Music Tectonics, where we go beneath the surface of music and tech. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa, the CEO of Rock, Paper, Scissors, a PR firm that specializes in music innovation and music tech. And one of my favorite things about this podcast is that I get to talk to people who come up with new ways to help artists, labels, and publishers generate new revenue. And when it really works, they also create more fun ways for music listeners to engage with music. I can't think of a bigger innovator in that balancing act than Daryl Ballantyne, the CEO and co-founder of Lyric Find. Daryl will be speaking at the Music Tectonics Conference. His company, Lyric Find, is a supernova supporter for Tectonics. He's egged us all along from the beginning when we first started thinking about it. Welcome back to Music Tectonics, Daryl. Uh, thanks, Dimitri. I'm really happy to be on here with you and obviously really looking forward to uh, Music Tectonics and seeing you and everybody else uh, in person and again, getting back to the awesomeness that is uh, the event and uh, and the people there. Yeah, we're gonna have we're gonna have a ton of fun. I, I think most of our listeners know that Lyric Find created this new revenue stream by gathering up basically all the lyrics of the world, putting them in a format that could be used in new digital formats, and working out the licensing deals between rights holders and digital platforms so that fans can actually see the lyrics right where they experience them. Um, but I think the last time we spoke on the podcast, you talked about your latest offerings, lyric videos and lyric IQ. I'm curious as we kick off to hear uh, how those are coming along. Let's start with lyric videos. What have you learned about that and how are they getting used since we last spoke, Daryl? So the lyric videos project has been, for me personally, it's been a ton of fun because it's a whole new area for us and where we get to work with uh, with labels and, and artists and really get into a bit more of the creative and content creation side uh, of things rather than just obviously transcribing the lyrics where the lyrics are what the lyrics are. But we kind of looked at that project as something where we had a really unique position of having a super high quality lyric database that was synchronized uh, to the master re recording uh, and how we could apply technology to that to open up a new revenue stream, uh, obviously for, for Lyric Find, but for artists and labels uh, as well. And it actually was uh, an idea that came to us from Bill Wilson from Monarch, uh, which at the time was uh, E1, where he said, hey, you've got all this data, uh, I feel like you could automate the production of lyric videos for us so we can monetize that. We looked at it and we thought, you know what, you're right. Uh, so what we've done with the lyric video product is created a, a, a system that allows us to really quickly and easily generate super high quality lyric videos uh, for labels based on them submitting us a, a feed of their recordings and metadata we match that with the lyrics that we have that are already vetted and synchronized either line by line or word by word. Uh, and we generate uh, a video based on uh, creative direction from uh, the artist or the label uh, and applying technology on top of all of it. So the end result is that we can make a huge quantity of lyric videos and we can do it really quickly and efficiently uh, because we've got that. So. What we've learned over the last year or so of providing this service is that overall lyric videos remain insanely popular. Uh, we've blown away the expectations of uh, our label clients and the popularity of, of the content uh, that it's received on, on YouTube and Vivo and other channels. Uh, and that there's a massive monetization opportunity for them through this content. Uh, it, we're able to turn around the videos super fast because of that uh, that automation and because of the existing data there. So it's a great way to have something there as a premium music video that can be monetized and and be controlled by the label and by the artist rather than it being a UGC uh, product that happens and then generates much much lower monetization for uh, for the label. So we've, over the, over the year, built out a huge amount of additional features in the product, things like different effects, different animations, title cards, uh, more translation functionality to be able to localize con content, uh, 
use of album art and other images and automating that that production uh you know more and more tools to make it easier for people to use uh, uh the system in a self-serve basis uh as well rather than uh a full serve where we're doing all, all of the work so the volume is fantastic uh and really really interesting we have projects that we're working on where we're generating 50,000, 100,000 videos for a single client uh, that we can just use the existing system for. Uh, so the monetization that we're seeing uh, is is incredible at scale, especially. So uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, it's so cool how, I mean, for the big first portion of Lyric Find, it was a lot of like data crunching, a lot of syncing up rights and use and then doing that whole thing that you talked about with syncing the syncing the or line, lining up the, the the words to the moments in the song so that you could sync it and synchronize it in different ways and uh, and now you have this whole other visual creative op- opportunity that you you can build on top of something that you know might not have been as sexy to be involved with <laughs> matching up rights and splits and territories and payments and all that kind of stuff and now you've got this whole creative side which is super cool but I'm curious like can you talk about the the is there a way to measure the value of of lyric lyric videos nowadays? Absolutely. I mean, the easiest way to measure the value is through usage, right? And when we look at usage on video platforms, uh, our average video in the in the first year uh, generated 40,000 views uh, per year was the, was the run rate. So when you think about that over a large scale catalog, and when we're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of videos, that's not just hits that are generating uh, a significant number of views. There's a lot of long tail content when it's there, when it's posted on the artist channel and the fans engage with it, that generates a huge amount of traffic that historically was just lost because there wasn't uh, a cost benefit to having a video produced instead of spending hundreds or thousands of dollars to have a video produced. Now we can do it uh, for no upfront cost uh, and capture all of that traffic. So it just becomes a huge amount of found money for the artist and the label. And when that content is there, both from a perspective of now we have a uh, label controlled PMV monetizable content uh, on there that takes over from UGC content and fills in all the gaps in the catalog where they just couldn't justify spending money to have a, a video made, but over the entire catalog adds up to a massive, massive amount of additional revenue for the labels. It, it's, it, it's incredible to see the scale of it and the growth and being able to just have that build over time by, by having that data, data there. And if you look at it's similar to Spotify and other streaming services overall usage. Yes, the uh, top of uh, of the uh, uh, of the charts makes up a huge the majority of of the of the usage, but there is an ever increasing amount of usage that is that long tail that is that catalog content, uh, and that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger every year on streaming services. And uh, that should be the case on video services as well. But having, producing a high quality video is expensive. So we can create a high quality lyric video, which fans love, the engagement is amazing. If you look at the comments on the, the videos that we produce, they're incredible to read. Whenever I'm, if I'm feeling a little, a little sad, I go and read them and feel, feel better. Uh, but uh, it, the engagement is real. The uh, translation videos, for example, are amazing for reaching uh, uh, foreign language fans and helping them understand the music and engage with the music so much more and have specific localized content. So it's been uh, it's been amazing to see for sure. And uh, the value that our clients are seeing is uh, way beyond even what we expected. 
So you've probably spent the last year or two thinking about lyric videos more than almost anybody on the planet. <laughs> uh, and, and the history of lyric videos are kind of interesting in themselves. You know, the, just the fact that lyric videos emerged as as a thing is kind of cool. And the, and the, the creativity that's been used in, in those, you know, probably had a had a peak at some point. What emerging trends are you seeing on the lyric video front? Since you're, since you're now the expert on <laughs> lyric videos, <laughs> um, especially legal ones, <laughs> uh, yeah. um, uh, I'm curious to see, like, what, where, where are they, where are they going now? Where are they going to go next? I think obviously there, there's the trend of volume that uh, you know we're help, helping to drive that that trend by making volume creation more attainable uh, and more economical. Uh, so that's certainly a part of it by being able to have those lyric videos as uh, label controlled, artist controlled, uh, PMV monetized, uh, where it's the lead video often for uh for a release we're working on a ton of new releases uh for labels because there's an album coming out and they're not going to be spending uh, a ton of money producing traditional music videos uh, and they want to make sure that they are getting the land grab of what is the first video on youtube with the song on there mm. make sure that the first one that's there is an official music video uh, that just happens to be a, a lyric video. So they capture the the optimum position in search algorithms. They capture the playlist that people make. They capture all of that activity and monetize it at a higher rate. And of course, that kind of discourages people from making a low quality UGC version, right? That monetizes that at a lower rate. So we're seeing a trend of not just filling in the back catalog and having that content available, but having it be the lead video of new releases, especially for emerging artists uh, that don't have the budget uh, as well, and putting that out there. And we're also seeing uh, a trend towards simplification. When we first started going into lyric video business uh, and we were talking to labels, they'd point to examples of what, you know, I'd uh, I want my lyric videos to look like this. And they're picking a super crazy, graphical, incredible Taylor Swift lyric video, right? That looks amazing, but is, I'm not ashamed to admit it, beyond our capabilities of what we're producing in, in our system. Uh, but then over time, they're realizing, wait a second, we don't need something that is a crazy graphical journey uh, through it with, super high production of, of live video and things in the background and and uh, and that we just need something that is clean is accurate sounds good uh, looks appealing to the to the eye and feeds the need of uh, of their fans especially with new releases to see what the lyrics are and understand what the lyrics are and listen to uh, the music on video services. So we've gone from people asking for uh, crazy high production stuff to people saying, we just want something that it, we can we can fill in the content gap there that it is clean, looks good, accurate, accurate lyrics are super key, um, obviously, and uh, and allows them to monetize it. Yeah, it makes, it makes sense that, um, you know, YouTube created this new space where people are discovering music or searching for music or it's their go-to place. And so you have to release a content on the official release date to hold, kind of hold your spot there. Um, so it's almost like in a way that, that labels had to follow suit in a way to, to meet that need. And now you have something that yeah. removes the obstacle of the $100,000 video. <laughs> exactly. You know, if you're not putting something out, especially for uh a any reasonably popular artist if you're not putting it out on day one on youtube some official video by day two there's going to be a bunch of ugc videos that are out there that are now capturing that place of of power in the algorithms right regardless uh, of whether they're the monetizing that's taking it. down the, your fan videos right. but at the same time you want the premium position 
you want the premium monetization. Right. Got it. Yeah. And so, so that there's that, are there other, are there other trends that we might see emerge on the Lydia lyric video front? Uh, I could imagine social video is, is exploding in a different yeah. way beyond YouTube. Yeah. Use on, uh, on social networks is, is definitely, uh, a, a huge request that, that we get. Um, so it is something that we're going to be working on the production of, uh, you know, vertical videos and, uh, and that, and building that into the, into the service. We can do it at a, uh, at more of a, a, a lower level right now, uh, and a manual level if we, we can, we can do the social, uh, sizing and, and that, but we're going to build that more into the automation of it. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be, uh, showcasing for the first time at music tectonics uh mm -hmm. is our whole platform that we've built to be able to integrate into indie distribution platforms mm -hmm. and into uh labels internal systems at, and that to be able to allow people to use a self-serve platform to create the, the the videos uh which then opens up the scale so much more that we'll be able to uh it access all of their mu music that's on the distribution platform within the video creation tool, uh, add and synchronize any lyrics that we happen to not have, although we probably have most of them at this point, but if it's pre-release, for example, they, they would need to, to add them in and automatically generate high volumes of, of videos to be able to fill out their own channels on that and you know be able to do that uh, without having to shell out a single penny uh beginning so a lot of that scale will be uh you know incredible to see even more so than what we've been doing so far over the next uh year so as a result i would say a trend that you will see next year is a huge increase of uh, uh of lyric videos being released by independent artists that will be able to use our platform. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited to hear that, that you're going to be kind of uh, launching that at Music Tectonics. That's what we want at the conference. We want people who are actually making tools that people are going to use, uh, getting getting deals done and so forth. So it's cool that you're using that as an opportunity to, to launch that into the world. You know, we're going to take a quick break with an announcement about the conference. And when we come back, I want to ask you about the other uh, new product you guys have been working on for a bit, Lyric IQ. We'll be right back. Hey, Music Tectonics podcast listeners, it's Shaylee here to give you some more Music Tectonics conference updates. The next update I want to share with you all is what is going to be happening on the morning of October 27th. So we are going to be at Expert Dojo, which is this rooftop open air venue just a couple blocks from the beach. And we are going to hear a presentation on the future of music from Media Research. We're gonna hear from analysts Chris Dakrar and Tatiana Sirasana as they give a data-driven presentation around how music is becoming a background activity as media consumption transitions to platforms like TikTok and Twitch rather than traditional DSPs like Spotify. Don't miss this presentation and all the other great things happening at the Music Tectonics Conference this year in Santa Monica, California, October 25th through 27th. Get your Music Tectonics Conference badge at musictectonics.com. All right, we're back. And Daryl, I was going to ask you about Lyric IQ. Uh, we talked about the, the Lyric videos, but I know that's one that uh, has kind of been developing and uh, you probably got a, a lot of new information about that. What's emerged on that front since we last spoke? Sure. So Lyric IQ, for those who haven't heard of it before, is a set of metadata that's built off of the lyrics themselves to, to help understand music. So there's really four components to it. Uh, there's uh, emotion and analysis where we're looking at the strength of each emotion present in the lyrics, uh, sentiment analysis, where we look at the overall positivity or negativity of an individual song, uh, content filters, uh, which we have, I think it's 32 different categories now that we're scoring each song on. So you can know, does this have not just high obscenity or explicit lyrics, but is it racist or is it racist to a particular group of people? 
does it have violent content or what type of violence is it? Is it police violence or racial violence or that? Does it reference gambling, smoking, drugs, alcohol, all the fun stuff that's in there? Uh, sex, obviously, and different types of uh, of sex categories are are rated in there. It's really all sorts of interesting content uh, that allows people to uh, to filter in or out specific types of, of data. Uh, and then the fourth component is subject matter analysis. So looking at deeper into the song and what are the topics that are discovered? What are the references that, that are in there? And what do they uh, what do they mean? And being able to tie music together based on what the song is actually about. So all of those things are built just off of the lyrics. We don't look at the audio at all. There's a tons of different products there that will try to judge mood uh, or emotion or sentiment off of what the song sounds like, but uh, it, we're not getting into that because we're, we're the lyric company, not the audio company. Uh, so we're basing everything solely off of the lyrics, which really tells a different story often uh, than the music. So when we look at uh, one, my favorite example uh, that I think I told you about once before, Dimitri, was uh, Mbop by Hanson, which when you listen to it, it's a happy, fun uh, song that uh, sounds really upbeat. But when you look at the lyrics, it's actually about growing old, losing your friends, losing your hair, and you know the excitement of life being gone, where it's like the mbop is gone, uh, which I admittedly had no idea until we looked at the lyric IQ data for it. I thought, well, that can't be right. And then I looked at the lyrics, and it was right. Uh, so things like that, you get really unique perspectives into the lyrics. So using that data, we have uh, a ton of different clients that are using it. everything from, we have health and fitness clients that are using it to help find more emotionally uplifting or, or, or you know, topical uh, content for their, their workouts. Also using it to filter out things that might be objectionable. Uh, there's lots of, of uses on, of the content filters for kid-friendly services. So one of the ones that we launched was uh, a streaming service with Gab Wireless, where they're using uh, Lyric IQ's content filters to make the entire service kid-friendly uh, and different implementations like that in, with in-store music and other places. There's lots of, uh, of songs that aren't flagged by the RIAA explicit lyrics flag because there's no rules about what song gets that uh, that flag. It's just if people feel like putting it on, put it on. It's a voluntary thing. And there's lots of songs that don't have words that are you know, part of George Carlin's Seven Dirty Words, but have all sorts of references to sex that my seven-year-old should not be listening to. Uh, so that's a huge use case for a lot of the data uh, that's in there. Uh, it's being used for recommendations. It's being used for Play, playlisting on uh, and things on on streaming service services. It's being used for figuring out you know relations between songs. Uh, you, know, you can imagine doing a playlist of songs uh, that uh, all talk about uh, Los Angeles or something like that, but are all different genres. Uh, so there's so many different interesting uses that we've found. Uh, sync licensing is another huge one catalog management where people who have uh, labels and publishers with large catalogs want to be able to search through it to find the right song, find the right fit for a sync placement. Uh, and it, it seems like every week somebody is coming to us with a new use for the data that uh, we hadn't anticipated when we originally started uh, the journey of building it. It's another cool example of how you all the time you've spent building this company to get access to this data first on a, a licensing front, then also getting a business model that would actually work so you can keep the lights on. And now to take it to the next level to build these other tiers on top of it. Um, it must be very fulfilling to, to, to be like, yes, this infrastructure, it was worth all this effort. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And being able to find more and more uses for the same data and more and more opportunities to help artists and rights holders maximize their income. And you know, traditionally, obviously we've been serving the publishing community, but now with, uh, with 
Lyric videos and Lyric IQ. We're able to help labels and their monetization. Uh, obviously, publishers still benefit from the monetization of Lyric videos as well because their claims capture all of that data. So their revenue from YouTube can go way up uh, as a result. Uh, being able to help sync placements, help the longer tail of artists uh, be discovered through Lyric IQ because their song is the right fit but the music supervisor has never heard of it. Well, now they can find it, uh, and now they can see the, uh, uh, the the meaning of that song and see that it's the perfect fit for their brand or for uh, their movie or TV show or or, or things. And do you, um, do, what, what, I'm curious what 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 else you imagine people using Lyric IQ for that hasn't happened? What were the requests that you haven't had that haven't had, but you're like, <laughs> well, why aren't this oh, this type of company approaching us? that hasn't happened. Um, so one of the ones that hasn't happened yet that I imagine would make a lot of sense is targeted advertising. Mm. Being able to look at uh, uh, all the references using subject matter analysis, like again, using the, the example of songs about LA, well, let's show an ad for LA tourism there next to it. Uh, songs that reference a particular brand uh, it, they might reference Mercedes. Well, let's show a Mercedes ad next to that, or for the hell, let's show a BMW ad next to it be, and say, "Hey, BMW is better than Mercedes." Maybe uh, not an endorsement, but <laughs> uh, to each their own. Um, so there's all sorts of those uh, opportunities, or even looking at uh, the the overall topics and moods of what people are listening to and learning about them using using that data and and surfacing relevant ads uh, based on on that. So that's that's something that when we started on this earlier on, we thought, okay, well, hey, ad supported stuff using uh, Lyric IQ subject matter and uh, and emotion sentiment analysis uh, will be really useful. And it's something that can really add in a new signal in ad targeting. Um, that's one that hasn't happened yet. So yeah, maybe, cool. uh, maybe soon. Maybe Anybody someone, listening, someone will listen to this podcast. That's right. Some ad yeah. tech companies are going to call you right, right away. I'm sure your phone's lighting up right now. I can see it. Daryl in the back. Wait, wait, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh. so, so much has changed in the last year. I'm wondering if we could widen out since you are one of the OG music tech founders <laughs> in the world here. Let's widen out and talk about the music industry as a whole. What changes have you seen in the last year that influence your direction as a company or how you perceive um, the, the, you know, where music is going. I mean, we've got everything from the explosion of TikTok to, you know, what's going on with music in the metaverse, obviously gaming. I don't know if we should talk about the, the rise and fall of NFTs or <laughs> you mentioned fitness, transportation, so many, so many different things. What, what are some of the changes that you're keeping an eye on this, uh, this past year that, that, uh, that may be influencing how you think about things? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny when you mention uh, NFTs, you've heard me complain about them in, in the past uh, uh, and that. So we never we never really got on that train and uh, I'm, I'm happy about. But I do think that NFTs going forward will start to focus on things that actually deliver some value to people. And you're not going to see like somebody buying the NFT of uh, an album and, or buying the NFT of Jack Dorsey's first tweet, right? Stuff that doesn't add any usefulness or anything to uh, uh, to the owner. Uh, you'll probably see things that are an NFT that gives access to certain events or you know, certain access to artists that can be resold, and you know, and everybody gets another kick at the uh, uh, at the can to get a piece of the revenue with that. Those things I can see there being uh, a utility for, but uh, not uh, kind of the historical just placeholder NFTs that that don't deliver value. Uh, but I do think that you know obviously TikTok is is huge and getting bigger and bigger and bigger uh, and creating a really different experience. And now you're seeing things like uh, uh, Rezo, their streaming service, which uh, is going into more and more territories around the world. And I think it's going to be a, a real uh, competitor going forward. 
uh, and a big factor in the music industry and tying that in to things that go viral and blow up because of, of TikTok. Like, it's a great way to both break new artists and re-break catalog content and, and have something surface that historically was, uh, uh, it was kind of forgotten uh, and then people bring it back. You know, it's kind of like the new, uh, new age version of when Bohemian Rhapsody blew up because of Wayne's World, right? When something enters uh, pop culture again. Uh, I think that's really interesting. Uh, I'm kind of on the fence on, on metaverse implementations because I do think that there's a great place for them and you can offer some really unique experiences. I don't think that we're all going to suddenly ditch uh, the the real world and live in the metaverse and uh, it's not going to be like a ready player one type of uh, of, of situation. So uh, there there's balance there, but in the music industry in particular, virtual concerts in the metaverse and those types of, uh, of interaction, uh, I think are going to be here to stay. And I think there's a whole lot of opportunity there to scale that and to add in uh, a lot more functionality. You know, we're looking at things like integrating lyrics into those virtual concerts, integrating translations of those lyrics. So you've got fans all over the world that you can't reach on a tour or that aren't going to uh, be able to afford to go to, to your show. And there, there's fans everywhere that don't speak the language of your music. So translations in general, not just in the metaverse and concert scenarios, but overall in the music con consumption ecosystem provides a great, great value uh, to, to artists and fans to really increase that engagement and that connection uh, to the music. So uh, I, I think that type of stuff is really interesting uh to to watch and uh has a lot of room to evolve uh, uh and we'll we'll stick around awesome so uh i can sort of hear the future coming coming in the background here we got to take a quick break and when i come back i want to ask you uh to to get a little sci-fi with us we'll be right back Whoa, the ideas are flying fast on this episode if you want to follow up on anything we're talking about today we've made it easy Head over to musictectonics.com and find this episode on the podcast page. You'll see show notes full of links and a timestamped roadmap of the conversation. We're not responsible for internet rabbit holes you tumble down in the process. Now, let's get back to the conversation. All right, we are back. And like I said, Daryl, it's time for us on this episode of Music Tectonics to get sci-fi. So what we like to do is ask you, what crazy futuristic things do you see happening in music 10 years from now? Do you want to get really crazy? Let's get crazy. Well, let's get crazy. Okay. Because my background is so much in licensing and rights management because of years and years of aggregating. You know what the a crazy thing to happen in 10 years <laughs> now would be is if there was all in licensing. Imagine a streaming service being able to go and say, I'm paying this royalty and it covers all the rights that I need instead of having to negotiate with so many different rights holders to just be able to do one thing with, with it or being able to have new uh, services evolve where you can get an all in license uh, for, uh, for a piece of music to, to use it without having to go to you know, especially in the publishing industry, uh, you know, sometimes 20, 30 different publishers for one, one song. Um, and it, I, I know that it's, it's, it's a fairy tale. It's not gonna, <laughs> it's not gonna happen, but, uh, it, and I understand with all the rights holders that they all want to negotiate their own deals. And if I was them, I would want to do the same thing. But when I think about like a, a, a music licensing utopia to let, uh, let a million flowers bloom, simplifying that process uh, and all the rights management that go, goes along with it would, I, I think, be incredible for the industry to allow all sorts of cool new things uh, to happen that you know, we probably haven't even thought about. I mean, do you think over time that maybe 
these new uses, the so-called new uses, which are now starting to be old uses, and then there's other new new uses that are happening. But do you think over time there'll be a stabilization of licensing in the digital realm where people get used to this is how it's done and this is what the value of that is? And so that it's not that each negotiation has to be different, but that you get additional revenue for each iteration of the use, you know, by the user as opposed to by the platform. I mean, like radio, you know, like at some point somebody said that, and I I know in America, radio is not a very great example (laughs) because there are missing royalties there, quite a bit of them. But, uh, but, but, you know, at some point, can someone just say, well, every time a person experiences, an individual experiences music, regardless of whether it's sonic or on top of visual or in the metaverse or has lyrics or doesn't have lyrics or what whatever like at some point do you you don't think like in 10 20 30 50 years there'll be like a, a uniform sense of the value of that in total and then people can pre-clear licenses in that sense i don't think it'll get to that point because i do think that music has a different value in different experiences Mm-hmm. When you think about music in gaming or in advertisement or things like that, uh, that is not the same value as somebody listening to a stream on Spotify. So I don't think you can equate uh, them as the same regardless of where it's happening. I do think, though, we, we already exist in a world where additional usage equals additional revenue. Mm-hmm. Uh, the issue is with streaming services that it's it's not necessarily additional revenue for the industry. It's additional revenue for the individual rights holder because the allocation changes of what the, the right. pot is, right? right? There's a fixed amount of money based on the number of subscribers and what they're paying and, uh, and revenue share in that. And that just gets allocated pro rata based on, on usage. So right now rights holders are fighting for uh, their share of this, the same pie. Uh, there's a difference in some services where it's not subscription based, where it is usage based and one, uh, one stream does not, uh, reduce the value of other streams. An incremental stream does not reduce the value of other streams. Um, but you know, if there is a world where we could say, okay, this is the value of uh, a stream on a deal, regardless of, um, you know, dividing up the pool, that would be a bit different, but also that's kind of where we were in, you know, 2002 through 2003, where there was the old penny of stream models and that broke the industry. So we, we can't go back to that. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't function. And you ended up in a world where your, your biggest users were your worst customers. Uh, so that's, that's not the type of experience that we want to be building, uh, but there's got to be ways to to simplify licensing overall and stop uh, stop fighting uh, as much as the industry does uh, over uh, the little bit of margins that exist. Well, I think in some ways you've given us the least sci-fi answer ever on the show, but also I think maybe you've given us the most sci-fi because you've also said you don't think it'll ever happen. So it's yeah, really I, fiction. The least sci-fi, but also the least realistic. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, you know, it's, well, we have a couple minutes left. I have two more questions for you. Um, and just to, to give it a practical flavor for all our startup founders out there, what tips do you have for other music tech startups that are just getting off the ground now since you have, you're have you a veteran at this point? This has been a decade plus in, I think. And uh, I'm sure they'd love to hear what you've learned. It's almost two decades now. It's over 18 years <laughs> since we started. So yeah, thanks for making me feel super old. <laughs> hey. uh, I, I think... You know, for anybody getting into a startup now, first of all, it's a great time to do a startup because we are he- likely heading into an economic downturn, which is the best time to start building a company, uh, which will make talent cheaper. It'll make uh, it, it easier to kind of hunker down and, and, and work on uh, on your product. And then ideally, if it takes uh, some time to develop uh, in, over a couple of years to, to build out a product to be ready to release. Ideally, you're releasing it when we're coming out of that downturn and everything's going up. So the timing is great. Uh, 
it also is a really good time uh, now to look at things that add real incremental value uh, to the people that you're trying to serve. So when you're doing something new, often you're dealing in hypotheticals. Uh, when you're heading into a downturn, it's harder to get somebody to buy into a hypothetical than it is to get somebody to buy into, hey, if you do this, there's a real benefit here. There's a real measurable uh, benefit to the product that we're offering, the revenue that it's going to generate for you, or the, the money that it's going to save you, depending on what type of product that, that you're offering. So that's the type of pitch that I would be doing uh, right now is what is the real tangible benefit that my new product can offer you, uh, future future customer, uh, and uh, and how are we both gonna uh, gonna benefit off of that? I will caution though that uh, in many ways I am the worst startup founder when it comes to uh, riding the 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 wave of hype. Right? You know, we've been here 18 years. There's been all sorts of companies that have been super hyped up. People have made tons of money off of them uh, and then they crash. So I'm terrible at giving advice about you know, jumping on a, a bandwagon and capitalizing it uh, on it. Uh, uh, you know, see NFTs that we were talking about before. Uh, so I, you know, my, my view is in building long-term, sustainable, profitable companies that can continue to uh, exist for a long time, not building a hype startup to flip it to somebody for uh, a bunch of money. Hey, it's great advice, Daryl. Um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we had our uh, Swimming with Narwhals startup competition semifinal, and we ended it with some speed networking online. And I met uh, a founder from uh, from India who said he's been listening to the podcast and it's helped him formulate how to think about a startup. So there's startups listening right now, Daryl, taking in your advice. I know because I meet them all over the world. You know, they call in or I meet them on these online things or eventually at a real conference, they come to Music Tech tectonics um in fact they're going to be there at music tectonics all the way from india we've had people from from israel from you know where we have folks coming in from south korea so these tips are being listened to i know on the podcast and it's helping us build this community so i really appreciate you being such a big supporter of music tectonics all these years um and uh let's let's round it out ask you like what are you hoping to get out of the music tectonics conference this year daryl uh, i mean so many things <laughs> it's <laughs> Uh, I'm looking forward to it uh, on a ton of different levels. You know, a uh, just being able to take the the lyric video uh, interface that uh, we were talking about earlier and 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 show that off. Uh, meet a whole bunch of new people and introduce them not just to to lyric videos and to our core uh, lyrics and, and and sync and translation product, but to lyric IQ uh, as well, and and you know find new uses for that data, find new uh, and cool and interesting companies that are uh, are coming up that we can work with. And you know, you talk about startups and they're listening. I frequently do a thirty minute uh, random calls with with startups. If anybody's listening, I'm happy to like just hop on the phone and talk about our experience and and try to help if I if I can. And I'm always happy to meet new companies, so feel free to reach out. Uh, but uh, it. One of the biggest things too at Music Tectonics is uh, seeing all the people. It's been you know many years through through the pandemic. Uh, when I came last year, as you know, it was my first time outside of Canada since the pandemic had, had started, and I had a huge grin on my face the entire time that I was there, and it kept going. And I, I even once I got back home, even my wife was saying like how much of a different person I was wow. because I was so happy that I just got to see everybody uh, and that. So, you know, I'm still kind of in that mode. It's been uh, a, a year of, of somewhat getting back out there and, and seeing everybody and it's picked up a lot more lately. But, you know, one of my biggest things that I'm looking forward to is, is, is seeing you and seeing everybody else, uh, all my friends that uh, I've gotten to know over these last 18 years uh, in the industry uh, in person uh, again, and uh, uh, and getting back to that cadence of you know, 
of of frequent live contact. Amazing, um, amazing, Daryl. I that, thrive on that and love it. Well, hey, I thrive on that feedback and and that uh, that level of enthusiasm for this. It makes it all worthwhile. So I'm super excited to see you in Santa Monica. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I think each time I talk to you on the podcast, it gets better and better. So really great insights today, not only about what you're doing, but tips for other folks and trends in the industry. It's been a blast. I can't wait to see you. Likewise, thanks for having me uh, on the podcast. Uh, always a pleasure and uh, really looking forward to uh, the event in a month. Yeah, see you then. Thanks for listening to Music Tectonics. If you like what you hear, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We have new episodes for you every week. Did you know you can dig deeper into all our episodes with the show notes at musictectonics.com. While you're there, look for the latest about our annual conference, sign up for our newsletter to get updates, or get the Music Tectonics app for music tech news. Everything we do explores seismic shifts that shake up music and technology the way the Earth's tectonic plates cause quakes and make mountains. Connect with Music Tectonics on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and find me, Dimitri Vitsa, if you can spell it, on LinkedIn. Bye-bye. You're listening to Music Tectonics.